you're struggling to get to grips with a guitar neck, if everything after about the fourth fret is just a bit of a mystery to you, and this whole area here is just a, a kind of nebulous mess, then the cage system really is what you want. And if you're wondering whether this is just one more gobbledygook, snake oil, newfangled system that still isn't going to work for you, well, let me tell you that as a professional musician, this is what guitarists use to communicate with each other. If you're transcribing, if you're soloing, if you're playing, if you're trying to work something out, if you're trying to show someone else something, then you're going to refer to things in terms of the caged system. Caged, C-A-G-E-D, named after these five simple major chord shapes. C, A, G, E, and D. And the essential idea behind the cage system is that there are really only five sensible ways to play a major chord on the guitar. It's one of those. Everything else is just a variation or an extension of that, as you'll see uh, as we work through the video. Now we're going to use these five chord shapes up and down the neck in all sorts of places to help visualize chord shapes, arpeggios, and all sorts of scales. You can take this as far as you like. You can use this for minor scales and modes and so on. And once you've got this under your fingers, you'll find that the whole neck opens up for you. Everything will start to feel a bit more familiar. Your playing will become much more intuitive, much more fluid, obviously, and above all, much more efficient. So let's crack on. And we're going to start with the C shape because that really is where everything begins. Now here's the entire range of the guitar from the bottom open string all the way up to G up here on the 15th fret of the top string. That's over three octaves. I've written out all the notes of the C major scale across that range and you can see how the C shape we're playing fits in. Take a look at the order of the notes in the chord. The lowest note, C, on the fifth string is the root. That's the first note of the scale which is what you'd expect. And the note on the fourth string is E. That's the third note of the scale. Then we get G on the third string. That's the fifth note of the scale. And finally, we repeat the root C and the third E on the top two strings. By the way, the correct term for a simple chord made from the root, third and fifth of the scale is a triad. And in this C shape, we have a triad played on the fifth, fourth and third strings and playing the triad, note by note in turn, is known as playing the arpeggio. To get to grips with the cage system, you'll want to think about playing the arpeggio of the chord, each note, one at a time, in the correct order, as far as the range of the shape will take you. That's really going to help you visualise the fingerboard. OK, let's move this shape up a couple of frets and see what we've got. Don't forget, we're going to need to move the open string notes up too. So now we have this. That's an arpeggio of D. I mean, you could bar the C shape to create a D chord, but that's not really what the cage system is about. We want to play the arpeggio because in a moment we're going to add notes to that to create scales. And as long as you know the names of the notes on the fifth string, you can begin your C shape there on whatever fret you like, and you'll have whatever arpeggio you're after. On the sixth fret, that's an E flat. Up here on the tenth fret, that's a G. Here's an E. And here's an A. And so on. Now let's just go back to our original C shape in first position. And you'll notice that you can, in fact, extend the arpeggio down and up to the full range of the shape, all the way down to low E and up as far as the G on the top string. And so now when we play this shape further up the neck, we can likewise extend the shape up and down across the whole range of this position. Now we're going to add notes to the arpeggio to create scale patterns, and I like to teach this in two stages. Back to the basic shape of C. Firstly, let's add the second and sixth notes of the scale. That's D and A. 
we just add that to the basic shape without extending across the whole range, we've got the triad plus the second and sixth, and that makes a pentatonic scale. If, for instance, we were to transfer that across to F, that's here on the eighth fret, we'd have this, that's F pentatonic. Or here's E pentatonic. And of course, we can extend across the whole range of the position for that pattern. The beauty of the pentatonic scale is it's really just a couple of extra notes added to the basic triad, so it's not complicated, it should still be pretty easy to see. And just to bed in the way the scale looks and feels and sounds, try playing a pentatonic melody such as Amazing Grace. It starts on the fifth of the scale. Now here it is in D. So that's in the lower octave of the pattern, and here it is in the upper octave. So this pattern stretches just far enough to allow us to play this tune in two different octaves, and it's worth playing up and down the whole range to help visualise and memorise. Finally then, back to our basic position for a C chord, and let's complete the major scale by adding the missing notes. That's the fourth, which is an F, and then the seventh, which is B, and here's how it looks. If we move that up the neck, we should be able to repeat that pattern elsewhere, for instance here. That's a G. And, as before, we play it across the whole range of the position. So that's the basic process. The simple shape, then the arpeggio, which is the notes of the triad in the right order, then adding the second and sixth. That creates a pentatonic scale, and finally adding the fourth and seventh too, so we can have a full major scale. Now you have a C-shape major scale pattern, and you can play it any way you like. up and down the neck. So now that we've got that first shape out of the way, you should find that the others are that much easier to process because we've already covered the key concepts such as the arpeggio, the scale and the triad. Let's move on to the A chord and just repeat the process. And what we want to do now is to move it up to C, just because that'll make it easy to see what's going on. If we play the chord of C using this shape, starting on the third fret and play each note in turn, you'll see that after the root we go straight to the fifth of the scale, G, without the E, so the arpeggio isn't complete. Let's add that missing note here, E on the second fret of the fourth string. And now when we play each note in turn, we have a coherent arpeggio. So you can already see that the raw chord shape needed a bit of a tweak before we could use it to build a scale pattern on. We had to flesh out the arpeggio. Now that we've done that, we can add the second and the sixth, like before. And then we can extend that across the range of the shape. And then maybe we can road test the pattern with a bit of Amazing Grace. 
Finally, as before, we'll create a whole major scale pattern with the addition of the 4th and the 7th. And you'll notice as we do this in the 2nd octave, we have to slip out of position to include that F. Up till now we've been able to assign each finger to a different fret, but now we have to reach up an extra fret. So we shift the pattern and the fingers just at that point. Anyway, let's move it up the neck, let's say to E, and you'll notice I'm starting with the second finger on the fifth string. Or up here on the tenth fret, that's going to be a G, and as before you might find it useful just to sketch out the arpeggio before you play the whole scale. So that's the A shape out of the way. Now let's move on to G, which goes across all six strings. And let's just move it up so it reaches to a C. And if we play across the notes of the chord again, you'll find that one of the notes of the continuous arpeggio is missing. Up on the second string, we have the third of the chord, but then we go straight up to the root again on the top string, so we're missing the fifth. So we have to insert it to make a proper arpeggio. Now just before we go on, notice the part of the pattern across the 4th, 3rd and 2nd strings, which in this position is on the 5th fret. That's actually the same as the part of the A shape we looked at just now. In fact, and we'll come back to this, each shape connects to another like this. We can see the back of the G shape is the same as the front of the A shape. Anyway, once we have the arpeggio, we can add the second and the sixth. And that's the pentatonic. And maybe we just have a little bit of Amazing Grace. And of course we need to complete the major scale by adding the 4th and the 7th. And as with the A shape, we actually have to slip out of our 4th fret pattern on one note. Now let's move it about. Here it is, down on the 6th fret for B flat. up to the 10th fret for a D major scale. Okay, nearly there now. Let's move on to the E shape, which is one of the most useful, and to my mind, actually one of the easiest ones to visualize. In its basic position, we can just pick across the strings and see whether we need to flesh out the arpeggio at all. Straight away you can see it goes from the root, E, on the 6th string, directly to the 5th of the chord, B, on the 5th string. So we're missing the 3rd, and we'll need to take care of that. After that it's back to the root on the 4th string, then there's the 3rd, G sharp, on the 3rd string, which is great, and then the 5th of the chord on the open 2nd string, and then the open top string is the root again. So actually it's just that missing third in the first octave we're going to need to insert to create a full flowing arpeggio. Let's move the shape up to the position for C to do that. And that third 
comes in here on the seventh fret of the fifth string. Now we have the full arpeggio. Now let's add the second and sixth notes for the pentatonic. And of course, Amazing Grace. Then we play a complete major scale by adding the 4th and 7th, of course. OK, we've got just one more to look at, and that's the D shape. It might not be used quite as much as the others, but sometimes it is pretty useful. And anyway, it completes the set. And in its basic position, it only uses four strings, which go root, fifth, root, third. So that's going to need a bit of work to create a proper arpeggio. And as before, we should take it up to C so we can compare more easily. It would start up here on the 10th fret of the fourth string. But if you're playing an acoustic guitar with a shorter neck, especially a classical guitar with the neck meets the body at the 12th fret, you might prefer to find the same shape in a different key lower down, like here starting on the 5th fret, where it's a G. Anyway, for me, back to C, I can find that missing third just behind the root on the 9th fret of the 3rd string, and then we can just play up the chord shape. And of course, we can extend it down on the bottom strings, like this. So the pentatonic, adding the second and the sixth, looks like this. And our old favourite. And of course, we'll add the fourth and the seventh to create the entire major scale. Which we could extend up and down. Now that we've got all our scale patterns together, it's worth thinking about this. The front part of each pattern, by which I mean the higher frets, overlaps with the back part, the lower frets, of the next pattern. Take a look at this G arpeggio played using the E shape. The front part here is the same as the back part of the D shape. for the same G. And then the front part of the D shape, this triangle up here on the top three strings, that forms the back of the C shape. And then the front part of the C shape here forms the back of the A shape. And as we've already seen, the front of the A shape this line of notes on the 2nd, 3rd and 4th strings, that makes the back of the G shape. And if your neck is long enough, you can keep going. Here are a couple of useful ideas to bed those patterns in. I'm doing this using a C shape playing a G scale, but of course it could be any pattern anywhere on the neck. I'm going to step up a third, and then back one, up a third, back one, up a third, and so on. This 
just needs a bit of thinking because it's not just going up and down the scale. Another good one is to play the notes of the triad starting on the root, then the triad starting on the second note of the scale, and so on. So that's it, the cage system. I really hope you found this video useful. You're going to want to spend a bit of time on this, working through probably each pattern in turn before moving on to the next one. But quite soon you should find that the neck is a bit less of a mystery than it was. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button, uh, maybe even subscribe to my channel. I'd be delighted to have you along. Many thanks for watching and see you on the next one.